Hello there, year, year 11 rather. Uh, this is your physics booster for paper one. I'm going to talk through this presentation pretty quick. So if you think I'm going too fast, I am on purpose. And then you can work through the presentation at your own leisure. So it's just going to explain how you should make best use of it. OK, here we go. Oh, look, it's a quiz burned by Mr. Weber. A very quick quiz just to test your basic knowledge. Uh, the answers follow on the next slide. Try it yourselves to test if you know the things you need to know and the skills that you're going to need. Well, look, here's the answers. Right, OK, there's the answers. Blah, 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 blah. Try not to look at them before you've done the quiz, OK? This is just for fun. Of course, you need, you do know the, well, you will be given the equations this time, so you don't need to learn them, but be aware where they are on that equation sheet. There's some more answers. Oh, yeah, more answers. Here we go. Here we go. We're getting through this now fast. OK, again, try not to look at these. There we go. That's for the quick quiz at the beginning. Oh, look, more answers. Gosh, this goes on a while, doesn't it? OK, it's, well, it says quick quiz. It's not really, is it? Here we go. There we go. That's the end of the quiz. Right, let's get on to the main bit. So these are the topics on paper one. If you're doing uh, triple science, then you will be doing astronomy. If you're doing combined science, it's just the first six topics. OK, right. These are the equations you would have had to learn in the past. You don't need to learn them anymore. Um, you are given them on that equation sheet. You need to be familiar with that equation sheet. I've attached a copy of the equation sheet to Satchel 1 so you can have a look at it. Make sure you know where those equations are. But lucky old you, you don't need to learn them this year. Next. Right, OK. The next set of slides are some example calculations for you to try. Um, notice little tricks in them. I've put these in on purpose. So, the, for example, there is kilonewtons. OK, you're given a force in kilonewtons. So watch out for your prefixes and watch out for things like this. When you're doing your real exams, when you're asked to give answers to a specific number of significant figures or an appropriate number of significant figures. If it's an appropriate number of significant figures, look how many significant figures are in the data given. And that's your clue. So in this question, for example, there's two significant figures. That's why they're asking for an answer to two significant figures. So if they ask for an appropriate number of significant figures, look at the data you're given. Anyway, the answers for those will be given. Again, no spoilers. There we are. There's another one. Again, no spoilers. Some little tricks in there. Watch out. Those little tricks rearranging the equations. Look, there's another prefix. Don't miss those out, please. Kilojoules, kilojoules. It should be in joules. Another one is milliseconds. It looks like meters per second. Just MS milliseconds when they give it for times. Again, no peeping. Okay, and there's another one. Oh, look, another trick there. Wavelengths in centimeters. It needs to be in meters. Those are the things you need to be looking out for when you're doing questions. Notice how I'm highlighting the key information as I read the question. You can do that in your exams as well. There's some bonus questions here as well. OK, so there's all sorts of stuff there to keep you busy and help you revise those topics. Those prefixes I've mentioned before, they're here. Look, giga, mega, kilo, milli. Remember the easiest way to convert. For example, if we look at the first one here, six microamps. Right, that funny U means micro. So have a look in the table. That's 10 to the minus six. So the easiest way to convert is literally to multiply that number by this power of 10. So in this case, microamps would be 6 times 10 to the minus 6. The next one, gigajoules, I don't even need to think about it. I just multiply by the appropriate number of uh, power of 10, which would be 10 to the 9. OK, so there's some examples for you. See, just stick that power of 10 on. That's the easiest way to do it. Get those powers of 10 into your heads and look out for those tricks in calculations. Anyway, that's for you to play with later. OK, so. Vector and scalar quantities. We're now on topic two. The first topic with real context. So vectors and scalars, they love this. Remember, very simply, scalars have magnitude only, and vectors have a magnitude and a direction with it. Lots of examples here of things that are scalars. So the main ones, remember, is speed is the scalar version of describing how many meters per second something moves with no particular direction. Could be going anywhere, north, south. It, we don't know where it's going. Whereas the vector version is velocity. Same for distance. Distance is a scalar. And we have displacement as the vector version of that. OK, the rest are fairly obvious. Any type of force, remember, is a vector. Any type, anything to do with energy is a scalar. OK, right. Ooh, what was that? I go through all of this because you can read it yourself. Remember, the result of vectors is a posh way of saying when we're combining vectors, most typically forces. We talk about the resultant force. So it's just the total force. Remember, if they're in opposite directions, you take them away. If they're pointing in the same direction, we simply add them. OK, there we go. So don't forget about vectors and scalars. They love questions on that. 
vectors have magnitude. Next up, distance time graphs. This is a distance time graph. Now remember, we can describe the motion just by looking at the shape of the graph. What is the mistake that everybody makes with this one? Well, in the first two seconds, what is this object doing? What is this goat, goat, what I'm doing? What is this goat doing? Right, the mistake people always make with this, this is a distance time graph. They always go, oh, it's accelerating. It's not accelerating, okay? Remember, on a distance time graph, any line, any straight line at an angle shows that it is going at a constant velocity, okay? Constant speed in plain English. So do not make that mistake. It's a distance time graph. That means it is a constant speed. This is also a constant speed, but slightly less because the gradient is less steep. Remember, the steeper the gradient, the faster the object is moving. The next bit's easy. It's not moving at all. It's stationary. Now, again, another mistake people make here. They think that it's actually um, decelerating. It's not decelerating because this is a distance time graph. It is still traveling at a constant speed. The only difference is it's going in the opposite direction. Okay, distance time graphs. We can work out numerical information from this graph as well by getting data off the graph okay so how far has it moved in the first two seconds you just read it off uh, two seconds it's gone 10 meters um, i can also work out velocities okay remember v equals x over t distance over time velocity is distance over time so it's gone 10 meters in two seconds 10 to five it's going at five meters per second okay similarly with the next part just looking at this section it's gone from 10 up to 14 so that's four meters it's moved it's taken two seconds to do that we could do the calculation I've got a minus on here because remember velocity is a vector and that shows that it's going in the opposite direction same process it's gone 40 meters in four seconds okay so distance time graphs okay again you can work through that slide at your leisure okay so on a distance time graph, this is what an acceleration looks like. It's a curve, okay? So in this case, the gradient's getting steeper. That shows us that it is actually accelerating. If you can hear singing in the background, that's Mr. Weber singing his favorite Eurovision. Hits the winner, I think. I think you'll find it. Oh, cool. Okay. Okay, so, and if the gradient was getting less steep, that would show it's decelerating, okay? So on a distance time graph, curved lines show accelerations or decelerations. Velocity time graphs looks very similar, doesn't it? Right, this is the one. Now we can say that it is accelerating, okay? Because it's a velocity time graph. The speed is changing. That's what acceleration means. Therefore, that's a constant speed. And therefore, that does show it's decelerating. So look at that y-axis. And if it is a velocity time graph, we can use those words. If it's a distance time graph, refer to the previous slide. We can again get lots of information off here. So to remember, to calculate accelerations, we use change of velocity over time, or V minus U over T. Um, yes, we can. Oh, and look, what speed is it going? Well, I can look anyway. At three meters per second, I can see it's going about 24. Read the graphs carefully. Um, here, it's going at 40 between the time of five and 10 seconds. The big thing you can also find um, is, uh, we can find the deceleration, don't forget. Deceleration, acceleration, same thing. We use the same equation. A equals V minus U over T. You can also work out the distance. The distance is the area under the graph. So you split it up into triangles and rectangles. And by calculating the size of those areas, we can actually work out the distance it travels. So in the first five seconds, that's a triangle. Half times the base times the height. Base times height divided by two. However you prefer to remember it. Okay? Again, it's all there for you. Work through this at your leisure. Okay, then we add those together to get the total distance that it's moved. Don't forget this equation. Very difficult equation. B squared minus U squared equals 2 times A times X. It is on your equation sheet, uh, but it's on the second side. It's not grouped with the rest of the motion equations. There's a couple of questions for you to try using that. Um, full working out is provided. So I'll go through that pretty quickly. Again, look at that at your leisure. You can hear the Eurovision songs. That's actually to my daughters. It's not Mr. Webber. I, I was lying. Um, they, they like Eurovision songs, poor things. Anyway, Newton's laws. Newton's first law. Okay. So that's basically if an object's stationary or it's going at constant speed, it means the forces acting on it are balanced. That's what it means in plain English. Okay. We're talking about balanced force situations. That's Newton's first law. The sum of the forces or the resultant force acting on the object is zero. The forces cancel out. Okay. That's Newton's first law. For you there about resultant forces okay so if they are the same they do cancel out 
if there is a resultant force that will make the object accelerate and that is Newton's second law okay so again if the forces were pointing in the same direction we would add them but if they're in opposite directions then we do indeed um, describing how forces change particularly in situations like parachute jumps where things reach terminal velocity so remember um, initially you will accelerate in a parachute jump because there is a resultant force downwards uh, the air resistance acting on you will increase there's a full explanation and eventually uh, that will mean the until they balance then the resultant force will be zero so you'll follow at constant speed again i'm not going to read through all this for you uh, but this is the kind of language you should be using in questions like that it could also be about as you see in red why cars reach a maximum speed and it's all about balanced and balanced forces but use these words so if something's accelerating there is a resultant force acting on it and if it's going at a constant speed or stationary, the resultant force is zero. That's the kind of language we should be using. We should. There is a Newton's second law, very simply, an equation. F equals m a, m times a, mass times acceleration. Really important equation, very good chance it will appear on your paper. Watch out for those pesky prefixes. If it does, they might have killer Newtons in there just to try and confuse you or the mass might be given in grams instead of kilograms remember to change from grams to kilograms then we simply divide by a thousand don't forget there's also a required practical in this topic uh, where we were accelerating trolleys those little things with wheels on down ramps and things through light gates <coughs> oh, excuse me we're investigating things like the relationship between the mass and the acceleration okay you might be asked to describe investigations remember if it says design an investigation then you need to explain how you would do that investigation what equipment you would use and what you would measure with that equipment okay so be very specific it won't be in this amount of detail we can see here uh, but this was the experiment we're doing the required practical again copy that we collected all of our data plus some graphs okay so remember Newton's third law is quite difficult I have made a pretty good video on this which I've attached as a link which explains it but in plain English it's every action there is an equal and opposite reaction okay so strangely there's the earth the earth exerts a gravitational force on the moon but equally the moon exerts a gravitational force on the earth and that's why we get tides and things rowing's a really good example why boats move in water so this bloke is pushing a force on the water so there's a force from the water on the oar and there's a force of the oar on the water okay there's a lot of water so it tends to look like the boat that's moving which is the case don't forget this equation as well for working out weight also remember you have to remember that the acceleration due to gravity on earth what is it altogether now that's right it's 10 meters per second squared or often called the gravitational field strength in which case it's still 10 but that's in newtons per kilogram then we go to momentum <laughs> oh my god oh god sorry i apologize for that yes momentum gosh that was loud uh, yep those all sound effects anyway momentum is mass times velocity strangely we use p for momentum but that, that's what it is it's units very easy to remember simply so the units of mass kilograms followed by the units of velocity meters per second kilograms meters per second um this bit's nice and easy. It's a nice, simple equation. It's on your sheet. Uh, where it gets more difficult is when we talk about conservation of momentum. So we have uh, different ver versions of this. So here we have two things colliding, and they stick together after the collision. Remember, once they stick together, we treat them as a common object. Okay, we treat them as a common object, but momentum must be conserved. And what that means is the total momentum before the collision in both the objects, that amount of momentum must be shared between the objects after the collision as well. Oh my god, mouse sounds, excuse me. Oh dear, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, apolo apologies. Um, yeah, so here, I've worked out the momentum of that one. Remember, this one's not moving. It's at rest, so its momentum is zero. That's what I'm showing there. And then afterwards, I've combined their masses. So the momentum afterwards is we're treating it as one object. So I've added their masses and times it by the velocity. Now it's the velocity I want to work out here. So I do all the maths. Remember, when you've got a complicated equation, do all the maths, change it round right at the end. So I've really reduced that down to a simple rearrangement. 
So they can be quite complicated, these questions, but don't be square, squared, don't be square, don't be scared. Write this down, write this statement down, total momentum before equals total momentum after, and you'll pick up some marks, okay? So don't just panic and give up. They are difficult questions if you get those. So that's the first situation we have. Um, they don't always stick together, okay? So we've got two objects here in a head-on collision, okay? They're going to hit each other from opposite directions. And I want to know what happens to this second object afterwards. Oh, there we go again. Sorry about this. Okay, so again, tricky is this one's going to be So this is the negative direction. So I'm saying this way is positive, this way is negative. Putting in all the numbers again, ignore that Newton seconds, that's an A level mistake, sorry. And rearrange it. Look how I'm doing it step by step. I'm writing it down. I'm not just trying to stick it all in the calculator at once. And I've got the right answer. So again, pretty difficult questions if you get them these, but try your best. Start with that statement. You'll pick up some marks because you're showing the examiner that you know that the momentum before the collision should be the same as the momentum afterwards. Write that down. You'll pick up some marks and then carefully put the numbers in. Work out their individual momentums and just think, are they going, if they're going in the same direction, you add the momentums. If they're in the opposite direction, you'll take them away. Okay, so here's a oh, sorry, version of uh, Newton's second law. And this is, in plain English, this is the change of momentum over time equals the force. Force is the rate of change of momentum. Now, this is applied to things like airbags, seatbelts, crumple zones in cars, uh, bending your knees when you jump. And it's all about how quickly this change of momentum happens. So when something stops, there is a change of momentum usually down to zero, and how quickly that stops decides how much force there is. So this is really important in safety features in cars like airbags, like crumple zones, okay? A very important little bit of the course. Okay, so there's some of the applications from it. So the reason why crumple zones, seat belts, airbags, even in your running shoes, your jogging shoes, your, the heels, the soles of them compress so you don't damage your knees. And it's all about making this change in momentum happen over a longer time. If you get an explanation question for this, write that equation down because it helps you to explain your answer. The equations are not just for calculations. They're also to help you when you're explaining answers with long written answers. OK, so that change in momentum happens over a bigger time. The time's bigger, and a smaller force. OK, so make sure you concentrate on them that they like to ask questions about these, these type of topics. OK, there, it explains it nicely in the green. Um, there's some higher work, OK, some of the higher work on uh, circular motion as well. Again, it's fairly straightforward that anything that moves in a circle is a centripetal force. OK, just watch out for those bold statements. Remember, the bold statements in the specification, which I've also attached, are for higher paper only. If you're doing the foundation paper, don't waste your time on those. Ignore them completely. So, as I should have said, that equation should not appear. The one I've just said on the previous slide will not appear on the foundation paper. Yeah, there's some more stuff about momentum. Yes, catching a cricket ball, pulling your hands back, reduces the uh, the change of momentum happens over a longer time, so it doesn't hurt when you catch the cricket ball. That's a good example. Uh, Come on, foundation alert only. Oh, yeah, don't forget the stopping distances chapter. It's explaining these statements here, okay? That, that, that could be a lovely question if you get a question on stopping distances and what affects it. Uh, this is this is really, really, really good. Nice topic. So don't forget, stopping distance is the breaking distance plus the thinking distance. The thinking distance is the distance you travel while while your reaction time is uh, effectively thinking, oh, no, there's a cat, I better stop. OK, that's your thinking distance. While you're thinking that, before you actually press the brakes, that's your thinking distance. And the braking distance is the physical distance it takes the car to stop once you press those brakes. OK. And there it is. Stopping distance equals thinking distance plus breaking distance. OK, and there's some uh, typical stopping distances. The blue part is the thinking distance. The red part's the breaking distance. Uh, again, higher paper people. Just look at this kinetic energy. Cars have kinetic energy. And in order to stop them, work needs to be done. Force times distance. OK, so you can work out stopping distances if you know the kinetic energy of the car and the force that the brakes apply. Next up, topic three. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Topic three, important topic. OK, so remember, we've got our energy stores. There they are. Lots of examples of them. They're their energy stores. And remember, their energy can be transferred from one energy store to another. 
and the way of transferring energy these are the words we should be using okay so by forces doing work for example if i lift something up and give it gravitational potential energy then i am transfer transferring that gravitational potential energy to while work doing work against gravity sorry can barely speak uh, don't forget chemical energy is anything you burn um a lot of energy gets transferred by electricity so anything that's electrical in our houses the energy is transferred into it by electricity um, if something gives out light or makes a noise, we say the energy is transferred to the surroundings by sound or light or by heating. Okay, where it normally ends up in a thermal energy store. Okay, the posh, the easiest way of saying the energy ends up in a thermal energy store is to say it is dissipated. Really useful word, it is dissipated. Okay, the energy normally heats up the surroundings and we say the energy is dissipated. Get that word in there. Sankey diagrams so uh, remember anything going forwards like the light in this case is energy be transferred usefully um, this is where the energy goes in so elect it's being transferred by electricity that should really say and anything going downwards is wasted energy it's thermal energy that that will all the energy will eventually be dissipated okay there we are and we can use this information to work out the efficiency, which is useful energy out divided by total energy in. So what does a machine or device give out that's useful and how much energy has gone into it? And remember, efficiency is normally a decimal. You can give a decimal, but you can change it to percentage by times it by 100. But if you do need to rearrange this equation, you can't use percentages. You must turn it back into a decimal. So, for example, if you had 55% efficiency before you used it in the equation, it should be actually used as 0.55. It should be turned back into a normal decimal before you start to, trying to use it in that equation to work out, say, the useful energy or the total energy. Okay. There's a little example for you. So this is a tricky one, this. Um, you can work out um, these missing values by looking using the graph paper. So this has happened in the past. So you can see there's four, one, two, three, four, there's five squares there which represent 200 joules of energy. So that means each of those little squares, well, 200 divided by five, must be worth 40 joules. So therefore the light's 80 joules and the heat is 120 joules. Look, it's all there for me. Don't forget, one of the most important things is heat can be transferred and it can be transferred in three main ways, conduction, convection, and radiation. So conduction is the main focus in topic one, but don't forget about convection and radiation. So this is all summarized on this slide. So hopefully you should be familiar with this. So radiation, remember, we're talking about infrared radiation. We use the word radiation a lot in physics, which is very confusing for people. But here we're talking about infrared radiation. Okay. Yeah, so you did that uh, practical with this as well, where, where we wrap the test tubes in different in uh, silver foil and in black paper and see where the water cooled down. So remember, um, black objects are good emitters and good absorbers and white or shiny things are poor emitters and poor absorbers of heat radiation oh look and there's that required practical we were talking about where we had the test tubes in different it was thrilling you remember you watch water cool um over a long period of time and we had test tubes wrapped in different materials and then we plotted a graph showing how comparing out which one cooled down the most and it should have been the one wrapped in black paper cooled down the quickest okay yeah so that's one of our required practicals so again say what you're using to measure so you're measuring the temperature with thermometers okay you need to make it a fair test so you need control variables like the same amount of water and that sort of thing Then very important, we have our energy resources. Okay, so remember, you need to know advantages and disadvantages of all these different energy resources. Two main groups, renewable and non-renewable. Remember, fossil fuels bad, refer to global warming, releasing CO2. Don't just say pollution. Actually state what is causing the pollution. Don't forget, coal can produce also acid rain. Uh, definitely mention CO2 um, when we're talking about fossil fuels. Um and advantages and disadvantages of each type of energy resource that could easily be a six mark question on that particular topic next topic is waves do not forget the definitions of transverse and longitudinal waves remember just about everything is a transverse wave apart from sound waves and p waves which are longitudinal that's all you need to remember so any other type of wave mentioned is going to be a transverse wave 
And when you are defining them, remember to compare the, the oscillations. You can say vibrations. Oscillations is a posh word for vibrations. Are per perpendicular to the direction that the wave travels or the energy is transferred um, in the case of transverse waves. And that the oscillations are parallel to the direction that the wave or the energy is transferred. Okay, Make sure you get those key phrases in. Frequency, amplitude, make sure you know what they mean. A little test here for you. Uh, some waves are shown on a cathode row, ray, cathode row, cathode ray oscilloscope screen. Okay, which one is the greatest amplitude? Which one is the greatest frequency? How can you tell? The answers are all there for you. Okay, make sure you can do questions like that. And here we are with this incredibly important equation, V equals F times lambda. Again, it's given to you on the sheet this year, your lucky things, and we did a core practical with that. Also remember, you can work out the speed of a wave just using distance over time. So if you remember, we had the ripple tanks and we were filming waves and we were measuring the distance they went and how long it took them to go that distance. We slowed it all down into slow motion so we could do it more accurately. Um, and then just use speed equals distance divided by time. We can also do it using V equals F lambda, which is a little more complicated, where we have to work out the frequency by counting how many waves went past a point in, say, 10 seconds, and then dividing that answer by 10, and then estimating the wavelength by comparing the waves between the, the crest of the waves on a ruler. Okay, the com So don't forget that two methods of working out the speed of a wave. We did that in class. That was one of our required practicals. Next up, all our lovely diagrams for reflection and most importantly, refraction. Remember, if it goes into something more dense, it bends towards the normal. And if it goes into something less dense, it bends away from the normal. OK, lots of examples there. 60 degree prisms. OK, triple only. Don't forget about total internal reflection and how you can investigate that and measure the critical angle. OK, really important. Again, we did that as an experiment in class. Um, don't forget, we should always measure our angles from the normal, okay? Triple only lenses, ray diagrams, okay? We did a lot of work on that. There's some examples on there. Remember how to draw them, okay? How to draw them. So these top diagrams are your basic diagrams, nice, easy diagrams to draw. They love to ask you to draw those. And then here are the more complicated ray diagrams. Practice drawing those. We did lots of that in class. That is triple only work, though. There's our refraction required practical where we did send light through the blocks. It's all about it bending away from the normal towards the normal. Remember, it slows down in denser materials and speeds up in less dense materials. That's light. Remember, sound waves behave the opposite way around. OK, be aware of that. That was our required practical. Then the electromagnetic spectrum. They love questions on this six mark questions. So make sure you know the order from biggest wavelength down to smallest wavelength. Remember the frequency. Is the opposite way around so if it has a big wavelength it has a small frequency okay and remember you need to know dangers and uses of each of them really really important it's all listed there that's here from your specification that's what you need to have in your head and they love to compare those in six mark questions to compare one type of radiation with another so talk about their wavelength talk about their frequency but also make sure you know how they are produced and their uses and their dangers this is triple only. Don't forget all your seismic wave stuff, ultrasound stuff, infrasound stuff. The seismic wave, remember, is exploration of the Earth's core. That innocent little statement there is all about our S waves and P waves. OK, and uh, really, really important. Remember, S waves cannot travel through liquids. That's why we know the Earth has a liquid core. And we worked out as an iron core and the waves refract as they travel through the Earth. And that's how we've worked out what the interior of the Earth's like. Don't forget these sonar questions where we're using speed equals distance divided by time. And that the time it takes it for the boat to get the signal back, it has to go down and return again. So remember to half that time if you're doing calculations. Okay, next up, very important topic, topic six, uh, radiation, radioactivity. Okay, so make sure you know your structure of the atom, your atomic numbers, etc. Oh, that table's gone wrong. Never mind. Okay. So we've got the atomic number. So remember, the, the atomic number is the number of protons, the atomic mass is the number of protons and neutrons. We get the neutrons by taking those two numbers away. Don't forget about electron orbits when um, 
atoms absorb radiation as the electrons move up to a higher energy level, then fall back down and re-emit some electromagnetic radiation. Don't forget the definition of isotopes. Don't forget we need to know about models of the atom. How do we know what atoms are made of? How do we find out? Okay, so it's all thinking about uh, Democrates and he, he came up with the idea of atoms then. Thomson developed it again. No, he didn't. Dalton de uh, developed the idea again that the atoms were like solid spheres. And then J.J. Thomson discovered the electron and came up with the plum pudding model. Okay. And the way they tested the plum pudding model was by doing the Rutherford's alpha scattering experiment. And this is what they observed. Okay. So you need to know what they observed. And then what did they find out from those observations? came up with the nuclear model of the atom. Remember, do not mention protons and neutrons. They had not been discovered. He just discovered mainly the atom was empty space, the electrons were orbiting the atom, and that there was a tiny, incredibly dense nucleus at the centre of the atom, which had a positive charge where most of the mass of the atom was. That's what they found out from those previous observations. Okay, next up is your different types of radioactive particles. We need to know about alpha particles. Remember, they're made of two protons, two neutrons. They're stopped by paper. Okay. And here's what the equations look like. That should be an arrow there, by the way. Uh, so the atomic mass goes down by four. The atomic mass goes by two. They're strongly ionizing. Don't forget all of that. There's another presentation connected that I've given a, a, on Satchel 1 that you can also look at, which is goes into it in a lot more detail. Okay, and don't forget we've got beta minus decay as well, where a, a neutron turns into a proton and an electron gets ejected. Again, have a look at that other presentation. Detail to myself, it's much better than this, and there's also a video I've put on as well. Those of radioactive videos, have a look at those, um, they'll really help you. Okay, and remember, gamma is just electromagnetic radiation. Don't forget, positron decay, um, what they're absorbed by. Have a look at that other presentation. This is a really important topic, and it comes up every single year. Something about alpha, beta, gamma, something like that. Okay, uh, da -da 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 Yep, uh, electron, yeah, um, yeah, so there's some more slides. I'll, I'm going to let you read through these. Okay, don't forget, um, triple people, you have to do fission and fusion. Uh, there's a few problems on there provided by Mr. Weber for you to do with solutions as well. Just to get your testing, don't forget about half-life, the time it takes for the activity to decrease by half, or the number of radioactive nuclei to decrease by half, and you can find it off the graph really easily, okay? I'm ready now because I've realised I've been talking for hours. Fission and fusion is triple only. Triple only. Okay. Um, have some idea how a nuclear reactor works, what the control rods are for, what the moderator is for. Remember, the moderator slows down the neutrons so that fission can occur, because otherwise the neutrons are going too fast. The control rods, there's a clue. They control how fast the reaction is. They absorb neutrons, okay? So don't get, yeah, don't forget that. Really, don't, please. Um, nuclear fusion is really important, okay? We're trying to develop nuclear fusion, but in the news recently, where we fuse atoms together, could solve all our problems for energy on planet Earth. Okay, so make sure you can talk about nuclear fusion. And there are the advantages of it over nuclear fission. Remember, nuclear fission is nasty. It produces lots of radioactive stuff. Okay, this is much, much nicer. And uh, we've got plentiful supplies of the fuel. Seawater, kind of. Anyway. Oh, so that's it for you combined people. You can go and have a rest now. I've lied down. I'm, you'll need it after listening to this. And uh, the rest of you tripled guys it's uh, astronomy time oh yes astronomy now there will definitely be a question on this topic okay so make sure you know the order of all the things in the solar system all the key facts i'm not going to read through all these okay make sure you know all about this all about orbits there is definitely going to be a question on this and then most importantly life stars um big bang theory comparing it to the steady state theory linking it to red shift and also cosmic micro microwave background radiation cmbr is the quickest way to say that okay really good candidate for a six marker remember you'll get two six markers on a triple paper really good chance this will come up or something about the life cycle of a star okay so it's all there redshift look out for diagrams like that they're redshift diagrams that tells us the galaxies are moving away from us and um, there's also a link to my youtube videos which explains it in under two minutes very valuable two minutes like that's quick okay but it's all summarized here and we're not going to go through it get this in your head it's not maths it's just facts you can all learn this and you should have been learning it by now i hope you have uh, for your sakes and mine to be honest and here we are at the end a few questions about astronomy especially these life cycle of a star ones make sure you know that life cycles of stars like the sun so they're quite you know kind of average mass stars and then much bigger mass stars which end up with neutron stars at the end of the cycle 
Okay, so make sure you can talk about how they form, how the atoms are brought together by gravity, and that the pressure builds up, and then eventually we get uh, we get our protostar, and when the pressure and the temperature are high enough, then nuclear fusion is possible. And helium, well, first of all, hydrogen is fused into helium, and then uh, if that's what our sun's doing now, then eventually once it's used up all the hydrogen, it will turn into a red giant. It's all written down there. Get that topic in your head, please. There will be a question on astronomy Probably about life cycle of the star, probably about the Big Bang. It could be either of them. It could be something else, order of the planets, orbits. That's it. I'm going to stop now. It's been tough, this. Um, there's loads of resources in Satchel One, loads of videos to help you work through this PowerPoint. Make sure you know your way around your uh, equation sheets. Good luck, really good luck. We are rooting for you. Do your best. Bye-bye for now. See you after the exam.